2,000 years at this point. In fact, we're um, three and a half years into the Great Tribulation at this point. Um, we've seen uh, this, this type of Antichrist in Antichus Epiphanes. And, but in the same way that Antichus Epiphanes would scheme and lie and manipulate to, to become ruler, Antichrist will do the same thing. He's going to be coming in as a peacemaker. It's a false peace. And then uh, he's going to make a deal with the, United, or with the nation of Israel. And then he's going to break it three and a half years into that. We'll read about this in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. Let's go ahead and back up to verse um, 25. Oh, I'm jumping too far ahead of myself here. My pages are sticking together, that's why. All right, pick, backing up to verse 29, actually. Or 24, I'm sorry, verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city. We know that has to do with the nation of Israel, Daniel's people being the Jews, and their holy city, city being Jerusalem. He says, 70 weeks have been decreed. And as we discussed last week and as we open up this morning, we're 483 years into these 70 weeks. 483 years of this prophecy has been fulfilled, and we've seen some great detail when it comes to these prophecies. We, and, and, and Daniel chapter 11 Daniel, or the angel Gabriel went into exact detail of how things would maneuver until this Antichus Epiphanes comes on the scene and uh, how he would take control. And that, that's basically this Antichus Epiphanes, again, he's a prototype. He's a type of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will not do the exact same things, but he will do things within this framework to come to power. And as the lies and manipulation with uh, smokes and mirror. Uh, smokes, <laughs> smoke and mirrors, he, he will come on the scene. And, but again, he will make a peace treaty. He talks about this in Daniel chapter 9. He says, uh, uh, verse 25, jumping down to verse 25, so you are to know and discern that from the issue of a decree to, re to restore and build, rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, a total of 69 weeks, or 483 years. It will be built again. The, the temple is going to be rebuilt again with molt, or with plaza, moat, and even in times of distress. It's going to be a really rough period, a bad patch of time. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. Jesus goes into Jerusalem. He's uh, after 483 years. And if we go with uh, Artaxerxes signing the, the decree, um, in four, uh, 445 B.C., the, from March 14th, 445 B.C., exactly 173,880 days as prophesied, Jesus rides into Jerusalem as the king of the Jews. The Jews uh, execute him. They crucify him. And the people, the prince who, who was to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So after Messiah comes, the city... Jerusalem would be destroyed, the temple would be destroyed, and as Jesus prophesied, not one stone would be left upon another. And so the temple's destroyed, and, um, and when Titus Vespian did this in 70 AD, when he rides in Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed. So the, there's no temple. There's going to be a temple rebuilt from Daniel's time. There's a prophecy of a temple rebuilt, and it was rebuilt, but then this temple that was rebuilt would be destroyed. And its end will come with a flood, even in the, in, in the end there will be war, desolations are determined. Then he says, this is where we have the 2,000 year gap. We're now entering into the final 70th week of Daniel. Seven years is what we're referring to in this final seven years. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, seven years, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice. If there are sacrifices, there is a temple. And we know from Revelation chapter 11, there's indeed a temple that's on the temple mount, and that the Antichrist will walk into that temple. He will declare himself to be God, and at this point, the Jews revolt against him. They're, he says, they're not buying it. You're not God. 
but he will set up some sort of idol, some sort of image in the temple. Just as Antichus Epiphanes did, so too will the Antichrist, the final Antichrist. And um, I'm just kind of curious what this thing is, uh, this false worship, what it might look like, and we might get a little hint of it here in a few, in a few minutes as we get deeper into Daniel. And it will make a firm covenant with the many, three and a half years into this covenant, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wings of abomination will come one who makes desolate even a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. He will be destroyed. Jesus will come back and he will be destroyed. But this is where we're at as we go into Daniel chapter 11. We're three and a half. He's already committed the abomination of desolation. We're in the last final three and a half years of the great tribulation. It's hell on earth. In the book of Revelation, as we shall see, we're going to see all kinds of natural disaster, all kinds of natural catastrophe, and natural things being even war, maybe even nuclear war. But in the final three and a half years of that great tribulation, there's going to be these demonic hordes coming up out of the pits of hell that are going to be tormenting people. People are going to be begging to die, but they will not be able to find death. They'll be in agony. They will be in torment. These are the supernatural phenomena, things that we cannot even imagine. They're real, but we just, it's just mind-boggling even to consider them. So what we're looking at, and in, in the midst of this, as the Jews have turned against the, the, the Antichrist, so too the world begins to turn against him. Verse uh, 36, And he will prosper until the indignation is finished. The indignation, the wrath of God is being, what's being referred to here. The indignation, the wrath of God. Now, we're not here. The church is already taken out of the way. Paul talks about this in 2 Thessalonians, that Antichrist will not, he cannot come until the Holy Spirit, until the church is taken out of the way. He cannot come. So the church is taken out of the way. And right here, we have a hint of the rapture. It's pointing to the rapture. Turn with me to Daniel, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 26, picking up verse 19. Your dead will live, their corpses will rise. You who live in the, in the dust, awake and shout for joy. Your dew, for your dew is a, the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. This is talking about a resurrection. A resurrection of the dead. Paul talks about, he says in, in this First Thessalonians, he said, The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them in the air. That's what this is referring to. It's talking about the dead rising up. But there's also the rapture of the church that takes place. And this is what he, he goes on to say in verse 20. He says, Come, my people, enter into your rooms. Close the door behind you. Hide for a little while, specifically seven years, until indignation runs its course. See, the God's people is taken up. They're in a bridal chamber, if you will, in heaven, until indignation runs its course. And what, did, what were we hearing about here? He says, until indignation is finished. The indignation, the wrath of God, is already being poured out. We know that wrath begins at the very outset, onset of the great tribulation period. We read in uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 19, that everyone is acknowledging that this is the indignation, that this is the wrath of God that is being poured out. He says, until indignation runs its course. And when does this begin? This indignation, when does this wrath be begin? Paul tells us that in the book of Romans chapter 11 that there's a fullness of time that must be fulfilled. The fullness of the Gentiles. In other words, 
all the Gentiles who are going to be saved prior to the, uh, the great tribulation, there's a fullness, there's a last person that's waiting to be saved before the church is taken up. This fullness of time is that 2,000-year gap that we find in Daniel chapter 9 that we just referred to. This 2,000-year gap. We find this 2,000-year gap that is filled, the time of the Gentiles, in Revelations chapters 2 and 3. And we're going to get into great detail when we get into the book of Revelation. There's, there's detail that's hard to see in the beginning, but once we get into it, you'll see this. There's the, the church age, seven periods of time that are given to us in detail. We, all we have to do is look at what's being said, look at the history of our, our time here on earth, and we can see how all these things were fulfilled. But it's at the end of this, this uh, seven period of church age that we find also in Revelation chapter 6, no, Revelation chapter 4, this is the church of Laodicea, this is the church of La the last church of the, the seven churches that's given to us, the seven church ages. This, this is the church of Laodicea that's referred to in chapter 3. It's the church that is being last spoken to. And it's a church who, who believes that they, they, they have it all. You know, we got food on our table, we got clothes on our back, we got a roof over our head, we're nice, we're comfortable, we have no need of anything. And Jesus says to this church, who's chosen to be blind, who's chosen to be naked. He says, I just as soon as spew you out of my mouth. That's the church of the last times. That's the church age in which we're now living in. Now, it doesn't describe each individual people. It describes the church age as a whole. But at the end of this church age, after the fullness of the Gentiles has come, Daniel, or I'm sorry, John, the revelator, he's called up into heaven. He says, after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the voice of a trumpet saying, or speaking with me, said, come up here. And, then, and it's the rapture of the church. And what does he go on to say through Isaiah? Enter into your rooms until indignation, the seven years of great tribulation, has run its course. As God is pouring out his wrath, the church is tucked away in heaven. And that's what Jesus said. He says, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many rooms. Come now, enter into your rooms. If, it's, if it wasn't so, I would not have told you. He says, if I go to prepare a place for you, don't you know that I'm going to come back and receive you to myself? Another thing we've got to understand, that the great tribulation period, what we've discussed through the book of Daniel, that seven years is all directed toward the Jew. It's about the Jew. And he's also pouring out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. And Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians, and we also read in many other places, that we are not destined for wrath. If you would, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Oh, yeah, chapter 5. He, said, he, he talks about the, he says, verse 8, chapter 5, verse 8, he says, but since we are of the day, we're not of this dark world, we're not of the night, since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the blessed breastplate of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation. In verse 9, he goes on to say, for God has not destined us for wrath. Wrath is being poured out on planet earth. We're not predestined for that. The wrath that we deserved has already taken place. It was poured out upon Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So what we're looking at is that time period now. We've, we've gone three and a half or 2,000 years into the future of Daniel, and we're coming to the final three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, a period that has uh, taken place, or the, the starting point is when the Antichrist goes into the temple, a temple that has yet to be rebuilt, but he's going to make this peace treaty with them to rebuild this temple. But all this begins 
with a war. And of course, we've talked about that as well, the, the Ezekiel 38-39 war, a war that is forecasted that has not yet taken place, but could, but, be, could, <laughs> but could be possibly unfolding right before our eyes in the Middle East, in Israel today. We see the Antichrist coming on the scene, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Now, there's four things here that we, we, I want to note. There's four horsemen. They're called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And these are something we're going to see as we get into the description or the video tonight. Um, we're going to see parts of it. It's not going to be in detail, but you're going to see parts of it. He says in verse, chapter 6, verse 1, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice, a voice of thunder, should I say, come. I looked and behold, a white horse. Jesus is going to return on a white horse. But the Antichrist is a mimicker. He, he copies. He copies what Jesus does. And that's another thing. One of the promises that we'll find in this video tonight as we see the, 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 the future that's coming one of the promises that is made by Noah Harari is eternal life. And we see that promise in the book of Revelation. Just as Jesus died and was buried and rose again, so too the Antichrist is going to die and rise again. He's going to mimic what Jesus has already done. But just in the same way, because the, Jesus says, because I've been resurrected, you can have eternal life. See, the hope, the promise is eternal life. And this is all coming through the advent of AI, artificial intelligence. And that's one of the things that, that Harari says can happen, and I believe we'll see unfold in, in, as we get into the, the Great Tribulation, it's going to unfold. I've risen from the dead. You too can rise from the dead. Just take this mark and worship the beast. What is this beast? AI, I believe. It's a computer system. It's a monitoring system. It's going to monitor all the people of the world. You're going to become a part of the beast. Just as we become a part of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, the people of the world will be a, can become one with this beast. We become one with God by way of the Holy Spirit. We become one with the Antichrist by the way of technology. We're gonna, it's, it's incredible stuff that we see happening right before our eyes right now. And the promise of eternal life. This is actually being made today outside of Jesus Christ. Not the cloud, or not the God of the clouds that are in heaven, but the God of the clouds of, of, of IBM, uh, the, the, uh, the, the network cloud, the internet cloud. Oh, wow. And anyway, I've gotten way off topic here. So here comes the Antichrist. He says, I looked and behold a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow. That is, he has power, and a crown was given to him. He's made king. Remember Antichrist Epiphanes, when he first came on the scene, he was not a king, but he made himself a king. So too, Antichrist is going to come out of complete and total obscurity. He's just going to show up and they're going to say, this is our king. This is the one who rule over. And so this crown is given to him. Why? Because he's going to be able to do what no other man has been able to do over the past 3,500 years. And that is to bring peace in the land of Israel. Peace with the Arab nations and the Jews. He's going to come in as a peacemaker. So Ezekiel 38 war happens. It's in Israel, you know, and then suddenly God intervenes. Maybe it's a nuclear war. We don't know. But somehow, you know, those who attack Israel is wiped out. Maybe there's a nuclear explosion. We don't know. Then after this happens, the Antichrist will come in. I got the solution. I've got all the answers to the problems. And they're going to make him a king. He rides in as a peacemaker. And a crown was given to him, and he went conquering and to conquer. So that's the first horseman of the apocalypse. The second horse of the apocalypse. 
He broke the second seal, and I heard a second living creature, creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. Red horse, speaking of the, of the horse of war. And just like we read in Daniel chapter 7, this Antichrist is going to come to power. Everyone's going to embrace him. But there's going to be three nations that reject him. And there's going to be a war that follows. We've seen this in Daniel chapter 11, or chapter 7. We see this unfolding in the Revelation. So immediately, he's a peacemaker, but then suddenly, war breaks out. To take peace from the earth, and men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. Power, now sword. He has a weapon now. The fifth, or the fourth, <laughs> the third horseman of the, of the apocalypse, verse 5. And he broke the third seal, and I heard this third living creature saying, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales. This is economics, a black scale. Only the world's not going to be in the black. They're actually going to be in the red. But notice what happens here. And what we're, you know, the, one of the things with the um, World Economic Forum is to bring in a new uh, currency, bring in a new economic system. That's admitted in the video. We've got to have a new economic system. So that's why I see the World Economic uh, Forum tying into this. Their goal and their broadcasting is, is to have a cashless society, to bring in a new economics. And they're preaching equality, but it's going to be far from equal. Those who, poor, who are poor are going to get poor. Those who are rich are going to get richer. Just like during the, 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 uh, the coronavirus, the epidemic, the billionaires got richer Everyone else got poor. That's exactly what happened. And we read here, this is exactly what's going to happen in the seven-year, uh, the great seven-year, uh, the great tribulation period, the, seven year, the final seven years. Verse 6, And I heard something like the voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, a quart of wheat, a day's, uh, a denarius was a day's wage, so you're going to walk, work all week for a loaf of bread, or all day. It's going to take a day's wage to buy just a loaf of bread. And three quarts of barley for Daenerys. The barley was um, the poor man's food. So, but it's still going to take a day's wage to buy barley. And do not damage the oil on the wine. The oil on the wine are the rich. They're not going to be harmed by this. So the poor get poor. The rich get richer. And it's all coming on the heels of the rising of this Antichrist. Then the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. Verse 7. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. When I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. The word, Greek word that's used here is chlorophyll. It was pale. It was sickly. It was sick looking. I mean, it could actually be trans translated green. It's grotesque. It's disgusting. This fourth horseman of the apocalypse. And he who has sat on it had the name Death in Hades. And death was following him. So death is coming. There's, a, there's war. Then there's an economic collapse. And now death is following. There's famine. Authority was given to him over a fourth of the earth. Death, a fourth of the earth is going to die at this point. There's going to be death. 25% of the world's population will die at this point. And this is the, just the very beginning of the Great Tribulation. <laughs> the doors are just opening. To kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence. And by the wild beasts of the earth. So it says kill with pestilence. That's diseases. And this is of the wild beasts of, of the earth. In other words, this thing is horrifying. The way this is translated, the Greek word that's used here is therion. It, and it says wild beasts. But it doesn't mean something that's huge, that's, that's gigantic. No, notice how it's associated with pestilence. This could be microscopic, but it's horrifying. 
So what we see is diseases, another coronavirus outbreak. I know all kinds of diseases are entering in to the world at this point. And I'm sure they're going to have vaccinations for that as well. They'll take care of it, right? That's the promise. We'll take care of that. We've got vaccinations for you. But the whole thing is all this is happening. And what we see developing here is Antichrist taking more and more control, having more and more power over people. So this is a, so what do we have? We have the, the as we come into the, the final 70th week, we find the Antichrist coming to power after a war, possibly the Ezekiel 38-39 war, which might be taking place today. He comes as a peacemaker. Everyone's impressed with him. And then they, he has a peace treaty. And then immediately war follows, just as we uh, read in Daniel chapter 11. Ten nations are going to come together. The world's going to be divided in ten different sections. But three of these kings, the ones that's gotten this power, are going to turn against him. But he's going to annihilate them and bring them into to submission. So, continuing on. Verse 37, Daniel chapter 11, verse 37. And we will get through this, believe it or not. And he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. So his upbringing, he's going to show no regard for the gods of his father, the God of his father. This could be a Jew who does not worship uh, the God of Abraham. Or this could be a Muslim who does not worship their God of Abraham. He's going to... That's one of the things that he's, I think he's going to be able to bring the world into submission because he's somehow going to be able to play upon all the religions. And that's one of the things that Noah Harari says, religion is good, it's just not real, it's just not reality. But religion has brought people in, you know, into control, has brought order to the world. And somehow this, and again, I encourage you to be here tonight, somehow this guy, this Antichrist, is going to be able to convince people, with the help of his false prophet is going to be able to convince people, hey, we're all worshiping the same God here. We can all come together here. And that's one of the things that we see in Revelation chapter 11. We see the temple on the temple mount, but the outer court is left out. Of, left out. It says, do not measure the outer court. Why? Because I believe that's where the mosque is setting today. The mosque is setting in the outer court. So what are we going to find? We're going to find the temple and the mosque sitting side by side upon that temple mount. This guy's going to be a peacemaker. He's going to bring all these people together, but he's not going to be a worship of the God of his fathers. He's going to be worshiping a different God, as we shall see. Or have a desire for women. This is interesting, because this guy, I believe, who could possibly be the false prophet, Yuval Noah Harari, is a homosexual. And it's just mind-boggling how he justifies that. It's not mind-boggling, it's just, if you don't believe in there's a God, and you only believe in evolution, then it makes perfect sense. And that's the thing. Now, the people of this world, the United Nations and the uh, uh, World Economic Forum, they're following this guy. This guy makes perfect sense. And if you, I've watched his seminars, and I encourage you guys to do that as well, because this, these seminars are being watched by governors and congressmen and senators and even the Hollywood elite. They're all buying into this. You watch his vi video and you're mesmerized because the way he presents it, it makes perfect sense. The problem with this, he eliminates God. He takes God out of the way. So if you move, remove God, then you have to embrace something. And you, you, what are you embracing? Science, evolution. Evolution, by the way, is not science. <laughs> that's, another, that's another argument. But anyway, it, it makes perfect sense. What he says makes perfect sense. And then verse, um, regard for any other God for he will magnify himself above them all. He says, I am your God. I am your salvation. That's what Antichrist comes up. Now, the false prophet is pushing this guy, and he'll make him into some sort of God. But that he'll be a worshiper of himself, his intellect, his power, his authority, his, his ability to communicate. That's what he's going to be a worshiper of. 
But instead, he will honor a God of fortresses. What is that? He says, a God whom his fathers did not know. This is something new. A God of fortresses. Something brand new. And you may remember that in the, in the t- chapter 7, there was a description. I'm sorry, it was in chapter 3. There was a descript- and chapter 7. There was a description of four beasts, right? There was the lion with the eagle's wings. A lion with eagle's wings doesn't exist, but it is a creature that we can see and understand. There are two creatures there that we know today, a lion and an eagle. And then there was this great and mighty bear, right? It's described using a bear, a creature that we can identify with. And then finally, there was the leopard. And you know, that would symbolize Alexander the Great, this leopard. Moved very quickly, very swiftly. But there was a creature that Daniel could not understand. It was an entirely different creature. And that we find that in Daniel chapter 7. Pick up verse 19. Then I desire to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast. There was four beasts. This is the, four, the, the fourth that he sees. This one was strange. This one was outrageous. This one was horrifying. I wanted understanding concerning this beast. Meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. It wasn't described as a creature that we can all know and understand. Exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze. He's, he's describing something he can't describe. I mean, he's trying to relate somehow. He said, is it teeth of, you know, dreadful teeth, teeth of iron, claws of bronze, in which devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And the meaning of the ten horns, which were on its, on its head, and the other horn, which came up. This is talking about the Antichrist coming to power. And before which three of them fell. That's the war that we just read in uh, Revelation chapter 6, the second horseman of the apocalypse. That the horn which had eyes and the mouth uttering great boast. So he's very boastful and large in appearance and, and, and then its associates. He kept looking. I kept looking and the, that horn was waging war with the saints. He's coming in direct opposition to God's people, this being the Jews. But one of the... Oh, you, you know, this uh, Yavol Noah Harari mocks all religion. He doesn't mock. He, he downplays all religion. But the only religion he attacks, the only religion he attacks is Christianity because it's truth. And he's presenting lies. And that's the, that's the religion, religion, we know that Christianity is not really a religion, it's a relationship with God. But that's the only one he attacks. And so he's going to blaspheme and attack those who live by the word of truth. Until the, anti, until the ancient of days comes and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, and the, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So the fourth, the fourth beast, verse 20, uh, 23, the, the fourth beast was, will be the fourth kingdom on the earth. And you know, a lot of people associate this with uh, the Roman Empire. I'm not so sure that the Roman Empire of Daniel's day, or I'm sorry, yeah, Daniel's day eventually, of uh, Jesus' day, I don't think the Roman Empire really had anything to do with this. This is, a, I mean, because the Roman Empire could be described with an eagle. It's the symbol. It was their symbol. And moved in swiftly, destroyed people, with iron, you know, claws cl- uh, of iron. But it could be. I'm not saying it's not. But this is something that's totally out of the ordinary, something that Daniel could not understand. He could understand the Roman Empire, I'm sure. But this is something he could not understand. And what I believe is being described here, this God is the God of technology. And, and this, this beast will be some sort of computer system that's going to be monitoring all the peoples of the world. So it was something he could not describe. But anyway, turning back to Daniel chapter 11. So he's going to mock God. He's going to blaspheme God. 
He's not going to worship the God of the fathers, and he's not going to have any desire for women. Um, that could mean he just don't have any respect for women, or it could mean that he's a homosexual and you know, just has no desire for women. A God whom his fathers did not know, he will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures. So everything is going to be poured into this God. Verses 39 through 44, we find, and we're going to just, I'm just going to tell you what's going on here, and what's going to happen, specific things that's going to happen in the final days. But what we're coming up to now, in the final three and a half years, he's describing how Antichrist is going to be drawn into the battle of Armageddon in the valley of Megiddo, where this great battle is going to take place. And then Daniel's told, he's going to be wiped out. He's going to be annihilated. Verse 45, he will pitch his tents, he will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. So what is described here is how He's, uh, he's wait, uh, all these other nations began to wage war, and they all come to the valley of Armageddon. They're coming to attack one another, but then suddenly Jesus breaks forth. They're coming in to, to destroy Jerusalem, to destroy the Antichrist, but suddenly Jesus is going to break forth. And all these nations are going to be destroyed. And, of course, the Antichrist will come to his end at this point. So, again, to wrap this up, uh, we're coming to, uh, to a close here. Um, there's, how should I do this? Let's go to verse 9. Yeah, let's go to verse 9. Verse 3, go to verse 3 first, right? Those who have insight, those who have insight, those who have understanding, those who see things that other people cannot see will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead many to righteousness, so those who have insight, those who have understanding, are leading many to righteousness. These are the last days. Those who see things that others can't see and lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars of heaven. Your reward is going to be in heaven, and you're going to be a bright, shining star. Of course, this is figurative language, but you're going to be shining brightly. Those who see what's happening, just like Daniel, who's seen what was happening, he started praying for his people, and then he started, you know, he started, uh, he had these visions, and God has explained these visions, and he began to communicate these visions, and his hope was to bring many to salvation. That should be our hope. And a lot of people say, well, you don't know the day or the hour. And I don't disagree with that. We don't know the day or the hour. I believe we can most certainly know possibly the year. We know, do know that Jesus said we will know the season in which we're living in. And how do we know this? By looking at Scripture. Just as Daniel looked at the prophecy, gained understanding, and then he began praying for people. And that's what we should be doing. It doesn't mean, just because we don't know the day of the hour, and, and that's something I actually could argue against. That was an enigma, 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 enigma. It was an enigma, something that, was, that people of his day could understand, but people of latter days or somebody that was outside of that culture could not understand. But let's say that we don't know the day of the hour. We cannot know the day of the hour. But Daniel tells us that there's going to be this unveiling, there's going to be this revealing of the things that were once sealed in this book. And it's going to be for the people of the last day so they can see what's happening and start making preparation of what's happening. What kinds of preparations should we be making? Proclaiming the gospel message, getting people saved, letting go of the things of this world, and embracing the hope of heaven. He said in verse 9, he said, Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. The, the idea is not the exact end of time. What was the King James Version? What was the wording there? Till the time of the end. Not the end of time. It's like, okay, we've come to the end of time. Now all this stuff is going to be revealed. No, the time of the end. That's the King James Version translation. 
the time of the end. When we get to, into the time of the end, the last days, then all this stuff is going to be unsealed. It's all going to come to the surface. People are going to be able to look at Scripture, look into the world, see what's happening, and they'll know that the time of the end has arrived. And I believe that's where we're at today. Again, this guy that we're going to be looking at today may not be the false prophet, but we can most certainly see the preparation for the time of the being made here and now. He says, for these are the word, these words con, were, con, are concealed and sealed up until the end of time or the time of the end. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. In other words, there's going to be many people who are purged, who's going to come to salvation, who's going to have understanding. They're going to be refined. But the wicked will just continue acting wickedly. No matter what they hear, no matter what they see, they're just going to be doing their own thing. And none of the wicked will understand. So there's a, there's a, a, a um, contrast that's being made here. The wicked will not understand. What's the contrast? Those who have wisdom, insight, will have understanding. Where does our wisdom and insight come? From the Word of God in His Holy Spirit operating in us. We will understand, but those who have insight will understand. Okay, will not understand. Verse 11, and he goes on to detail. He said, from the time of the regular sacrifices abolished, until the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. That's something we'll get into later in the Revelation. But it's three and a half years into the Great Tribulation. But it's for you, Daniel. Go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again. There's going to be a resurrection for you. At the end of the age. Okay, now, going over to... 2 Thessalonians once more. I just want to reiterate, reinforce that which we can know what's happening. We may not know the exact day or the hour, but we can know the season and even possibly the year itself. I don't, I'm not saying I do. I'm not even trying to prophesy it, but... What the Bible tells us, yes, no, people may not know the exact day or the hour, but we're not going to be blindsided by this. We're going to have insight. We're going to have understanding. He says, verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, and we'll close with this. Now we request you, brother, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together to Him, that you not quickly be shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from one of us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord. A lot of people say the day of the Lord is when He comes back and sets foot on planet earth. No, that's not the day of the Lord. That's the second coming of the Lord. The day of the Lord begins in darkness. The day of the Lord begins in chaos. You remember? God says there was evening and then there was, ev or there was evening and... There was evening and there was morning the first day. It began in darkness. It ended in daylight. That's how the Jews keep track of their time. Their, their, their day begins in darkness. And it ends with light. That's how the day of the Lord is going to begin. In darkness. Total and complete chaos. Complete darkness upon the earth. That's when the wrath of God will begin to pour out. The day of the Lord is the beginning of the great tribulation period because he's making preparations to come to planet earth and then it will end with the brightness of his light upon earth. He says, but there's lots of rumors and saying, well, we're already in the tribulation. Paul's telling them, no, you cannot be in the tribulation. It's impossible. Let no one say to you, any of you, I'm sorry, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. What is he saying there? See, in Paul's day, Christianity was afresh. It was new. It was growing. Paul says there's going to be an, a falling away from this truth. In other words, there's going to be this great church age. At the end of this great church age, there's going to be a falling away. What do we see in the church of Laodicea? 
the church of the last age, a falling away from truth. This falling away began when God's focus went back to his Jewish people, May 14, 1948, when Israel became a, a nation again. We can look at that time and see this rebellious teenagers. We can see the women's lib movement becoming even greater, and we can see the family breaking apart. Why? Because people were turning away from their God. In 1948, 75% of, the, uh, of our country went to church. Today, there's 15% of, of family, families that go to church. There's been a great apostasy, a great falling away. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. There's a apostasy, and then he will be revealed. The son of destruction who opposes and exhausts himself above every soul god or object of worship. So that he takes his seat in the temple. That's what Paul's talking about. This guy's going to come on the scene. He's going to be revealed, but it cannot. It will not be revealed until the church is taken out of the way. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him. There's a restrainer in place right now. It's keeping Antichrist from coming to power. That restrainer is the Holy Spirit. Where does the Holy Spirit reside? Revive? Uh, where does he reside? In his people. And you know what restrains him now. So that his time will be, will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. How many of you see this lawlessness that's already at work? Especially since the COVID crisis. I mean, cities are just, there's, there's chaos. And they're, they're, they're defunding the police. They're, they're, allowing the, they're opening our borders. It's lawlessness that's abounding right now. Lawlessness even in the home, the rebellion of children. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, until the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. Then that lawlessness will, lawless one will be revealed. When will Antichrist be revealed? When the church is removed. So, we don't know the day or the hour of the rapture at this point. We do know that it will not, it cannot, it will not, take place until we're taken up out of the way. My point in all this, we don't have to worry about those seven years of great tribulation. We're not a part of it. But we do have people. We do have family. We do have friends. that, Unless they come to the truth, they'll go, they're going to buy into these lies and deceptions. Listen to what goes on to say here. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the, the, by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accordance with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So those who do not receive Jesus today are going to go into this, and they're going to perish. They're going to die. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence. Once the church is taken out of the way, this deluding influence is going to move in. People are going to buy into the lie. They're going to believe everything that's coming out of this Antichrist mouth. And deluding influence, so they will believe what is false. Again, we're in heaven. Our hope is in heaven. And that's my hope is for you that you're, you'll stop white-knuckling this world and worried about the petty little problems of this world. And since you say, my petty, I just lost my job. My house burned down. It's petty in comparison to heaven. We're just passing through. We've got to let go. We've got to take our focus off of ourselves because our people will perish. They'll die in the great tribulation if they don't come to the truth. And when this Antichrist comes on the scene, you're just like they're going to believe everything that's coming out of his mouth. Again, I encourage you guys to be here tonight. We're going to get deeper. Yeah. Yeah.